Hello, everyone. We're going to get started right now. Uh, try to get, be punctual and start right on the dot. So hopefully everyone is uh, logged in and ready to join us. Thanks very much for joining the webinar today about lithium storage solutions. Uh, this is a joint webinar that's being given by Morningstar and Fortress Power. My name is Brad Berwald. I'm the product manager with Morningstar Corporation. And joining me today is Jing Yu, the manager, managing director uh, with Fortress Power. So each of us have a portion of the presentation that we'd like to give you and make sure that the information is thorough and complimentary. We can refer back to each other uh, during the presentation on how our products work together and also tell you a little bit about our products and uh, the uh, lithium market. So we will be recording this webinar and we'll be sending all registrants a link to the recording in an email that's gonna be going out tomorrow. Uh, you'll also see in the handout section of the GoToWebinar dashboard that we've included a copy of the webinar slides in a PDF format. And we've also got links to important documents, including data sheets and implementation guides that are also available from uh, within the presentation. So we definitely recommend that you go to the handout section and download those files now if you'd like. And if you have questions during the webinar, uh, feel free to text them in using the questions pane in the dashboard and uh, we will take some time at the end of the presentation to address those. So feel free to submit questions at any time, but what we will do is try to reserve time at the end of the presentation uh, to ask them unless they happen to be you know, pertinent to the section that we're on, just so we keep the, the time flow going for everyone. Okay, and then if your question is asked but is not answered, uh, you know, we may have uh, more than we're able to take during the window of time for the webinar, then what we'll do is we'll send you uh, answers to those questions via email as well, because we do want to get back to everyone. Okay, so with that, we will get started. Again, advanced lithium storage made simple with Fortress Power and Morningstar. And I will uh, give you our introduction here. As I said, Jing will be presenting shortly. Uh, she is on the webinar now with myself and I am the product manager and I'll be covering the first section of the webinar. Okay, so we will get started. So Morningstar's background first, uh, over 4 million units have been sold since 1993 across our entire product line. So we've been doing this for uh, quite a few number of years, uh, being experts in the off-grid industry. Uh, we have one of the lowest failure rates in the industry and we are definitely considered the experts in both charge controllers and some small inverter products line. Uh, we have a very diversified product line for a lot of different markets and a variety of needs. And I'll be talking a little bit about the portfolio later. Uh, we do cover many different industries, including rural electrification. Wanted to take note of a recent project that is in the finishing stages of implementation. And that was the project that we worked on in Peru providing power for 175 homes using our DC energy box. It also covered 3,000 community centers and gave power access to over 1 million people in the country of Peru. So we're very excited that that is in the final stages and uh, most likely one of the largest off-grid deployment projects uh, that we're aware of in the industry. So we also provide a lot of solutions in commercial applications, industrial and telecom, oil and gas, uh, the railroad industry, security, and a lot of also recreational applications such as mobile and marine, agricultural, and uh, the list goes on. So a little bit about our portfolio. Uh, one of the things we like to do is give a little bit of information in terms of the breadth of our product line. This is both the models that are available as well as the different families or lines that are represented. And you'll find that Morningstar's products generally have a very a wide uh, variety of applications that we serve. In some cases, the controllers being specifically designed with features or certifications that address the needs of that market. An example being oil and gas, we have hazardous location, we have lighting controller specific models with lighting timers built in and certain needs for different types of lights, and we try to make them um, you know, really well suited for the application at hand. And you'll see that in the industry, among many competitors, we definitely have uh, one of the widest ranges of products and a lot more of a specific focus on these needs as I described. So in terms of talking about lithium compatible, which is why we're here to, uh, to discuss today during the webinar, a lot of our products also contain full programmability options. And those listed here, the ProStar and TriStar, uh, SunSaver MPPT, ProStar MPPT, 
uh, you know, a variety of both PWM and solar, uh, PWM as well as MPPT solar charge controllers all have programming options that allow them to be custom configured for a variety of battery chemistries and specifically for the needs of lithium with um, specific lithium centric settings. And I'll be talking about those a little bit later in the presentation, but just wanted to give you an idea of the portfolio that's addressed. Now, to tell you a little bit about the solar controller itself and its main role in the products, um, it converts the PV panel voltage to proper output for the battery. With PPT, this is extremely important um, because there's often a variety of modules that are used, some higher voltage, and it will convert those down to the proper battery voltage of 12, 24, or 48 volts. It prevents overcharging of the battery. It provides management also of the DC load output as well as sometimes lighting control or other specific timing needs. Um, and the right controller is a really important part of the system because it's really the heart. All the energy in a, uh, a DC off-grid system specifically is going either in or out of the charge controller from the battery. So it sort of sees everything and manages uh, almost all critical applications, as well as displays the, uh, the metering information for them as well. So it's really the heart of the system. And you know, making a poor choice uh, in terms of battery charge quality can definitely cause a lot of problems and and I would go as far as to say kill batteries uh, if not charged properly uh, because temperature and other impacts um, you know small voltage differences over time can make a, a very Im big impact on the life of the battery so that's very important to note so a little more detail about the differences between charge controllers um, MPPT controllers uh, specifically our track star variation of this technology is really important where um, you've got instances of uh, clouds or possible shading that can occur because that shading affects the IV curve of the solar module and a PowerPoint tracker will actually adjust to and retrack that new IV curve and make the best use of the power that's available during those conditions. So it's something that you definitely want to be putting to use in a, a system where that could occur, especially mobile applications could be an RV, even equipment or mobile power stations that are on the move that get deployed in different locations at different times. Um, you know, a PPT controller can really do a great job in maximizing power there. It also takes advantage of cold weather, which causes the cell temperature to drop and the power output to actually increase. And that is a big benefit for uh, harnessing the extra power boost that comes from those sunny cold days. So. Definitely if you're in Canada, <laughs> we've got more than a few great stories of uh, extreme power output uh, from some customers there using MPPT controllers. And as you're aware with the grid tie industry and the wide variety of solar modules available, uh, 36 cell modules would be your typical 12 volt charging type module for a battery. But as we know, 60 cell and 72 cell modules, sometimes even higher than that. I know there's some 90s and some custom applications those modules can also be used with an MPPT controller in order to charge uh, lower voltage batteries. So that's really critical. And again, um, due to the efficiency curves and the very tight tracking and control of the TrackStar MPPT algorithm, uh, in many cases, you can see up to a 30% yield versus a, an equivalent PWM or switching controller uh, that does not utilize MPPT. So it's definitely uh, the best power output. With PWM, there are still a variety of PWM controllers in use, and they definitely do still have a very large role in the industry. Uh, they are more cost effective, and in cases of high heat or possibly simpler design, they are still uh, well utilized, and we are you know, still producing PWM controllers to this day. They, they both have a large place in the market. Uh, it's just about choosing the right application for the right technology and utilizing the right um, you know, pricing and value decision making. Okay. And Morningstar's PWM is, is a patented technology using our uh, pulse width modulation. And um, all of these controllers, regardless of whether they're PVT or PWM, they do provide four-stage charging. So in getting to the point of our webinar, one of the most important things that we talk about with customers, and we try to listen to our customers and provide good feedback to them on you know, what they're asking for, whether it be products, features, or even support, things we can do to help them in the market. And as many as 30% of system inquiries have been in the last couple of years inquiring about the use of lithium in remote solar applications as lithium has gained and grown as a, a larger and larger portion of, of the market. And they're looking to us for 
you know, confidence. They're looking for communication from us regarding our charge controllers to make sure that they are compatible with the batteries that they're using. And one of the most common requests we've seen is uh, the need for manufacturer vetted. In other words, you know, they don't just want our recommendation. They they want collaboration with the manufacturers of these batteries. And we want to make sure that that Morningstar and the battery manufacturer are on the same page regarding these settings and that we provide confidence and unified communication to our customer base on what settings they should be using. And because of that, uh, that's the reason that we created the Energy Storage Partners Program at Morningstar in order to provide this clarity and this information directly to our customers. So what Energy Storage Partners is, is it is a, a program that encompasses uh, many different aspects. Uh, webinars such as this, where we can communicate with our partners, such as Fortress Power. Um, it is uh, some background work that we have taken with the partners, working with um, the manufacturers to assure that the system designers have the compatibility and interoperability that they'd like. Um, we think that this type of information makes systems easier to understand. It takes some of the complexity out, maybe some of the risk with system design. And then in the case of our website, which I'll be showing a little bit later, it provides end users with well-documented, uh, you know, controlled energy system data that is, uh, you know, proven to perform. And we've got that list of partners there, and I'll, I'll be covering that. And we'll refer to some of the information that's available uh, from the Energy Storage Partners Program. And if any of us see, uh, if any of you are able to see Morningstar at many of the trade shows that we exhibit in the solar industry, as well as many other vertical markets, uh, you can see often our partners featured with us in that trade show booth, which is very useful. Okay, so that's a bit of an introduction. With that, what I will do is introduce Jing Yu, the Managing Director of Fortress Power, and I will hand the webinar over to her so she can tell you a little bit about their products and their company. Okay, Jing, please uh, take it away. Sure, thank you, Brett. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, thanks to the Morningstar team for organizing this webinar. Um, at Fortress Power, we also help customer design system a lot, and very often we will, you know, recommend um, Morningstar equipment due to its small footprint, highly reliable product, and of course, also very, uh, you know, competitively priced. And it has been very a pleasure to work with the Morningstar team uh, and to help a lot of installers or customers around the world. So let me talk a little bit about Fortress Power, who we are. So we are a lithium battery manufacturer based right outside of Philadelphia. We have 30,000 square foot facility here where we R&D test and store products. We do also have logistics centers in California and Florida. Um, as you can see, we have also solar panels on the roof, about 100 kW, and of course, it's also backed up by Fortress Power Battery. Our manufacturing facility is located in Shenzhen, China. Um, it has been, they have been making lithium battery cells since 2008. It's also ISO and OSAS certified, that's very important. Um, it has 800 megawatt hour capacity. The majority quality goes to the automotive uh, industry. Um, you know, as you probably know that automotive is the uh, deployment of lithium battery really has um, driven down the cost of the lithium battery. So let's move forward here. We have a lot of um, batteries installed, you know, with or without solar. So you can use with solar, without solar. But I would say that most of applications, you know, are installed with a solar array. And how can energy storage benefit you? Um, there's multiple applications you can use. Um, traditionally, there's a lot of, you know, use for off-grid applications. Um, and then now there's a more and more grid interactive system. As you probably know, the traditional PV inverter shuts off and the grid, grid goes off. Now, by adding a hybrid inverter with a charge controller, you can keep your um, solar system up and running, and that will provide you the backup power during a power outage. Or you're in the area that the grid is very vulnerable, you can set up a PV plus storage to be your primary source, and you can use a uh, grid as a backup power. Or you're in an area, for instance, like California, you have a time of use rate. And I know there's more and more um, states or even countries are um, looking to the time of use rate 
um, in that case, you can have a storage to take the power either from PV or from the grid during the off-peak, and then you can use the battery to supply the load during the peak period. Uh, very often, also business will be charged by the so-called KW demand charge by adding a storage. It can also help you to reduce that um, KW charge or demand charge. Good. So let's take a look at what battery types that we offer. Uh, we have offered three types. They are all 48 volts battery. We, the big unit we offer is 18.5, which is 360 amp hour. And then the next one is the 10 kilowatt hour uh, with a 200 amp hour uh, capacity. The smallest one we offer at the moment is a 5 kilowatt hour, and it's coming up soon here uh, in a few weeks. We're also looking to make you know, smaller um, batteries as well in the future, that more for smaller applications. Now, when we talk about the lithium battery, um, there's one component that is very important. It's called battery management system. And this is very different than the lead assets battery that you probably used in the past. So the battery management system is made of you know, lots of power electronics, and the quality is very, very critical. If not, then you can end up get, you know, pay very high price tag for lithium battery and it does not work. Um, so what we do is in our battery management systems, we use, you know, um, relay based BMS so they can handle large currents, but also we have sensors um, in many different spots to monitoring the voltage, temperature, amperage to prevent from overcharging either discharging, overheat, overcurrent, or short circuit. That's important. Uh, on top of that, we also um, monitoring, our battery management systems also monitoring each battery cell's voltage and balance them if needed. And that's to make sure that each battery cell will operating at the same level and to guarantee the long lifespan. So when you look into any lithium battery, just make sure you take a little bit of time to dig into the battery management systems. This is all the, some basic technical information of our three battery types we offer. I'm not going to go through one by one, just a couple of highlights. First of all, it's a 48 volts. So when you select charge control or inverter, you would choose a 48 volts DC input. Um, and also important to set up, you know, um, maximum charge and discharge current in the inverter or charge controller based on the spec sheets and based on, you know, how many units you use. Uh, the EVO, the lot big, the one come in with their LCD display, going to show you the um, state of charge, the charging and discharging current, as well as um, some arrow message there, you know, if there's a high voltage or low voltage or um, for example, there will be shown there's a um, sign you, you can diagnostic locally. Um, you can stack eight of them. The 10 and the 5 does not come in with the display, and you can stack two, so it's more for small applications. And also the e-vote um, comes in with the communication, and I know we are talking to Morningstar in the future, talk about it, you know, establish the communication. That way, it just makes you the system works even more smooth together. Uh, and you don't have to set up those parameters because it will be all preset. And we offer, you know, 6,000 cycles at 80% DOD, um, five years standard warranty, and then there's another additional five years available to purchase uh, for some, you know, um, area. Again, you know, we also have to uh, take the climate in consideration. That's just very typical for a battery. And we're going to talk about that later. So if you look at there, I'm sure you're aware that energy storage is our most exciting um, topic in the renewable energy sector. Um, and um, the reasons that, you know, the falling cost has really urged the market to grow rapidly. Um, in addition to that, there's also a lot of federal and state incentives. As you become more and more, you know, people re realize that climate change is happening. And here in the United States, you know, on the state level, uh, more and more uh, governors have set up very uh, aggressive renewable energy portfolio. 
stand up like 100%, the 100% go renewable, which is really good. So I think this is a very good business for all of us. And of course, another uh, fact is the time of use management. We talk about, you know, more and more utilities want to move into time of use because that way they are, can charge more money uh, and storage can prevent them doing that. So let's also take a look at some uh, numbers that published on GTM research. So as you can see, um, we took the data from the U.S. here because the U.S. is becoming the largest energy storage market with a 21% projected global share ratio this year. As you can see that in the next few years, it's going to grow um, almost to six times. This year, the volume is going to double. And also, very encouragingly, the residential and commercial sector is going to constitute over 50% of market share. So this is a game for everyone. So there's enough you know, business for everyone, not just for the utility uh, companies. Good. Um, now, let's also take a look um, how the different battery technology is going to benefit from this growth. As you can see, the lead asset will continue to grow while the lithium has surpassed the lead asset in 2017 become the number one solution and will continue to secure its position. So that's, you know, certainly very exciting for manufacturers like us. Now, I'm also going to do some battery technology comparison here that help you to understand why lithium has, you know, become the best solution for energy storage application. I will start with their compare different lithium chemistries because we got very often questioned by the client, you know, what chemistry you use, you know, is that the lithium iron or lithium iron phosphate? So I want to take this opportunity to, to show you the different chemistry and make a, a simple comparison here. There's a many different lithium chemistries available in the market. Widely, I think, you know, widely commercialized are three. Um, one is lithium ferrophosphate, or you can also name lithium iron phosphate, or even life core. So it's the same chemistry we talk about. The other one's called nickel magnet cobalt. So the short term is NMC. Sometimes people also call it the lithium iron. The third one's lithium polymer or lipo. Those are the three types. We choose lithium ferro or iron phosphate. Let's use LP as a you know, abbreviation. So that we choose the LP chemistry because it's safety. Um, it can be fully recycled. It has very good thermal stability. And also it delivers much substantially more cycles. So we offer 6,000 cycles at 8% DOD. And you look at NMC or LiPo, they do have higher power density, but it comes with a cost, safety, poor thermal stability, and of course also less cycles. The other um, advantage that LFP chemistry has is, is the degradation rate is slower than the other two types. And that also means it's going to last longer. There is a video on YouTube that you can type in, search LFP versus N MC nail test, and then you will see um, the LFP cell only release a little bit smoke, that's it, while the NMC cell exploded right away. So this is very scary. And I'm sure that you might also heard some incidents happen to, you know, some electrical vehicles. Now, I also want to use some graphics. I know it's a small graphics, but I'm trying to put in one, you know, uh, slide here um, to show you the advantage that LFP has compared to uh, lead asset batteries here. So the first thing come out is the what, what's shown the, what the nameplate capacity on the LFP battery is an actual capacity. So for instance, use the LFP 10 as an example, it's 200 amp hour. That means you will get a 200 amp hour out of the battery. While lead asset only typically allowed 50% step of discharge. So the actual capacity of 200 amp hour battery is only 100 amp hour. So there's a big difference. 
right? That also determines, you know, how much useful power you can get from the battery bank. And uh, there's some, this graphic I showed how the, you know, charging, discharging rate, temperature, and double discharge are going to impact on the LP battery. Um, so you can see that the impact of those three factors, like charging, discharging rate, temperature, and DOD is much less on the LP than on the that SS battery. So that means LP batteries, you know, it's much more consistent. But um, I also made a, a, a graphic here um, that to compare, do apple to apple comparison here. So there's, um, you know, three different lithium chemistry. We took also one flat net asset battery and AGM battery and also the nickel iron battery and made a comparison. To start with the round trip efficiency, um, LFP has the best round trip efficiency, 98%. The nickel iron has the lowest. It's only 65%. Now, um, in terms of the cycles, so we provide 6,000 cycle at 80% DOD. If you look at other, um, the flat and AGM is only 3 to 500. Um, the nickel iron is pretty good. They actually have the highest cycle numbers, 8,000. Now, let's use off-grid example, because typically in off-grid application, you would set up you know, one cycle a day Take one cycle a day in consideration, then with LP can last you 15, 16 years. The flat AGM is a year or two, and the nickel iron is pretty good, 22 years. They do last very long, but again, it's very bulky and uh, the run chip efficiency is very low. So, especially if you use with solar, you can imagine that you're getting you know, 30 some percent losses. Now, um, let's also take a look at energy throughput in megawatt hour, that's basically a total amount of energy that a battery can be expected to store and deliver over its lifespan. Uh, you also take the, the cycles, the use for capacity, the efficiency in consideration, and then come up with this number here. LC battery that we offer, it costs around 14 cents. The next one's Nick Orange, pretty good, 19 cents. But the flood and AGM are really expensive. They are, you know, four or five times more expensive, um, especially for off-grid off application. If you need that many energy throughput, lithium offers the best solution for you. It is safe, no maintenance. Um, you know, so we have um, talked to many clients that use lead assets and the batteries, and they really, really. Uh, have problems to go back to, you know, put a water in. And a lot of times they will forget about it. And then, of course, it's going to shorten life span. Here's this example to show in the space requirement. Uh, um, on the left, there is an AGM battery that's 48 volts, 2050 amp hour. The useful power is 6 kilowatt hour. On the right is the E volt. Um, it 18, has 18.5 usable power. So it's three times more capacity. And if you look at Space requirement is really, you know, um, one third of the space that you need. Here's just a quick summary that the technology advantage of the LFP chemistry is very safe. We talk about, you know, um, energy throughput. It lasts very long. And the most important, it offers low energy cost. Because you pay the utility companies by kilowatt hour. So you want to make sure for your PV plus storage system, you also pay low kilowatt hour. Now, we have uh, uh, several, first of all, we, um, the you know, Morningstar team is you know, being very ahead of curve and uh, work on this ESA program um, to really help uh, people to move into the lithium uh, technology. We have also, um, on our website, published some parameter setting guides with different inverter and chargers. Of course, Morningstar is one of that. Um, when you look at the lithium battery and use it with the um, inverter or chargers, it's a couple of things are important. First is the setup the high and the low voltage. So make sure you're not, not over charge or discharge. And the other thing is, um, set up the maximum charge and discharge current because you don't want the inverter or, um, or charge controllers too much, push too much current into the battery. 
again, there's a battery management system. It can only handle um, certain currents. Now, you want to also take turn off equalization and set, set up absorption time as low as possible. Um, the tra tradition lead asset, you will flow two hours even longer with a lithium two to six minutes are sufficient. Okay, so I will switch back to Brad and he will talk about how to set up lithium battery with the Morningstar equipment. Brad, please take over. Okay, thank you very much, Jing, for that broad coverage of your products and a lot of the technology and really the insight into uh, the specific chemistry used with LFP is uh, really useful. So thank you very much. Okay, so moving on, I will um, take things in uh, a little bit of the direction of, you know, now that we've heard about lithium and the, and the, the chemistry and a lot of the benefits it provides, uh, what we'd like to do is talk a little bit more at the system level of, you know, what you can expect to need or to be able to do with your charge controllers in order to properly charge it. And that could be charge controllers, it could be an inverter charger, as Jing mentioned, a, a hybrid system as well. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the characteristics that can really affect system behavior. So first, as Jing had mentioned, a battery management system. You know, so the BMS is uh, uh, an integrated, uh, you know, more than just some power electronics, it's really a, a system that maintains all of the individual cells, uh, often many more than you'll find in lead acid inside of a battery. And we need to make sure that that's either built into the battery itself or is utilized as a external device in the system. And um, that is what, you know, is providing a lot of the protection. The BMS itself is not included in, in Morningstar's products, but is expected to be provided by the manufacturer. Um, another impact of lithium is the narrow voltage range of, uh, of lithium in terms of its ability to go from high to low voltage during its operation from 100% to 0% state of charge is a lot narrower than you'll find in lead acid batteries. And that is generally a very good thing because it means that the voltage is very stable and you typically don't have that kind of, I refer to it as the bounce that lead acid batteries often experience when you put a heavy load on them and draw a lot of charge current out. And also they get a bit of a, an artificial rise in voltage when you put them under charge for the same reasons. So uh, lithium is a little more stable and it has a very high discharge and an acceptance current rate that um, maintains that uh, more stable voltage output. Um, the one downside of that is that it is a tighter window of operation and therefore a little bit harder to interpret voltage in terms of measuring what the true state of charge is. But luckily, a lot of the batteries provide internal state of charge calculations to a much higher degree of accuracy uh, directly inside the battery using the BMS. So that's typically not a concern. Um, cold temperature charging. Uh, lithium does have a, a wide range of uh, operating temperatures, but in some extreme cold, it can be too low of a temperature for it to actually accept charge. It may be able to actually discharge, but would not be able to be recharged, especially at higher temperature, or I'm sorry, higher currents in that temperature range. Um, but that's fine because it will affect the battery negatively. We would just need to compensate for that cold temperature. And generally we do that with what we call our fold back system, and that reduces current based on temperature. And I'll be talking a little bit about that later. Um, one of the other things to keep in mind with lithium is that if they were in fact, did not have uh, an internal LVD and the controller's LVD was not there to protect the battery, um, a, a battery cell, a lithium battery cell, you should never fully discharge. It can actually cause damage to the cell. Luckily, when they are in a package system, uh, you know, such as those provided by Fortress, then that is not a risk because it will disconnect internally. But that is an aspect that is quite a bit different from lead acid. Um, another aspect of lithium is they have a very low self-discharge rate. So if they were left in just sitting with no low draw, you know, all batteries have a bit of a decline in their state of charge just due to time and their internal resistance that can eat a little bit of power. Uh, but lithium is among the lowest in terms of self-discharge. Um, another thing is that they have a very high uh, charge acceptance rate. As I said, it's not uncommon to see a a C1 or uh, I'm sorry, 1C rating, which means basically providing as much energy into the battery as it can take to fully charge it in a, uh, a, a single, um, a, basically a, a temperature and voltage rating that is equal to its entire capacity. It can be charged at a much greater rate. You'll see 
uh, that lead acid can usually take no more than a fifth of its capacity in terms of charge rate. So lithium's acceptance is much greater. And that's why you're seeing, you know, with a lot of electric vehicles, the ability for it to, uh, you know, take on and recharge in half an hour or even 60 minutes to uh, a very high capacity. And then one of impact is that is important to mention is there is a higher upfront cost with lithium batteries. But as you typically see from a lot of the data provided, um, in terms of its overall lifetime, maintenance, and all other total cost of ownership aspects, that that uh, higher upfront cost is generally uh, not an issue because you've got a very low operational cost over the length of the system. And that's that total cost of ownership is what most customers are, are looking at most importantly during their investment period for their system. Okay, so with that, I want to talk a little bit specifically about the charge controllers themselves and how we correlate these needs for lithium with what we offer in our products. So first, as I mentioned, the lithium foldback for charge current based on temperature. This is something that can be programmed into the controller. Each controller can be set specifically for the curve provided by different batteries. So you put in the voltage at which you need to start tapering back. You put in the lowest voltage that it can accept. Um, and it will adjust current automatically. Um, they also provide an interactive display option. So a, a lot of times the pertinent information in the charge controller can be readily read from the system and it allows you feedback and ease of changing charge settings such as absorption, float, uh, the critical load disconnect point to ensure that everything is operational. All those can be set up using the meter display as well. Um, we do include both internal as well as most commonly external remote temperature sense uh, terminals on the controllers. And one of the things that we have seen uh, used that is a bit of a system trick that is very useful for batteries uh, that require a uh, basically a charge shutoff is oftentimes our controllers, there's some tech notes available that can tell you how to use the RTS disconnect as a way for the battery to signal to the controller that it's will, that it's, it needs to stop accepting charge at that point due to some battery parameters. So that's something else. The, the controller's interface between the battery and the controller itself can often be uh, you know, set up so that they work uh, harmoniously together. Um, another item is programmability. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the settings, but besides the meter display, uh, a data port is an easy way to load a complete configuration profile for a specific battery manufacturer and model into the controller in a single step. And we're gonna go over that just in a few slides. And then the last thing that we offer on many of our controllers that is very useful for uh, lithium charging is voltage sense. Um, often you'll see a lot of breakers and other hardware equipment that is in use in a system that causes voltage drops between the controller and the battery. You know, breakers, fuse blocks, uh, terminals, and what we do, uh, e even the distance of the wire itself, if you have a voltage drop over several meters in industrial applications, we compensate for that by taking that voltage drop out uh, by using the voltage sense lines that are built into the controller. So I just wanted to show a quick graph here so that when I talk about the fullback, what you understand is actually happening. So here you can see this is the max current that lithium batteries are able to accept. Of course, at higher temperatures, extremely high uh, you know, charge uh, ratings in terms of the current that can go into the battery. But as you drop close to zero C and you get down below freezing, you'll see that it has to drop dramatically and that the battery could accept damage if it were to take current at these low temperatures. So what we do is the, for instance, the ProStar MPPT can actually be programmed that at these temperatures, it will enact a linear decline in current and it will keep essentially that orange bar under the blue current threshold for what that battery can accept at that time. So that still allows us to charge the battery, but it, it, we compensate for the temperature as we do it, and that provides safe operation. And it works both ways. As the battery warms back up again, which is highly likely, you know, when the sun comes up and temperatures rise, then the charge current goes back up again, okay? So some advanced custom settings that are, um, many times used in special cases with our charge controllers that I wanted to talk about a little bit. Uh, first, um, we do have some additional features that will protect loads as well as batteries from certain instances of faults in the system. One of those is a high voltage disconnect. So if the loads are on the battery and there is an excessively high battery voltage, if the load is connected to the load output of the charge controller, we will disconnect the load 
of course, it turns the load off, but will protect that load from being exposed to high battery voltages. And that can be uh, very important in many applications. We also provide a maximum regulation voltage, and that allows you to set a max voltage that the load can see, and we will clip the charging and not go above that voltage. For instance, if the load was something that operated from in a, in a low voltage system, 10 to 15 volts, and you didn't want to see anything higher than 15 volts, the controller would limit voltage at that point. Um, we can also provide an absorption extension feature. And what this does is if your battery goes through a period where it's cycled very deeply and at a very low state of charge, and you want to make sure that the absorption stage is long enough to get all the energy back into that battery, then what we can do is provide an extension of the absorption based on that deep discharge. So that's sort of a another little side mode of operation that can be enabled in a lot of our products. And then lastly, temperature compensation, typically used in a lot of other chemistries, uh, can be changed from the standard, uh, you know, five millivolts per degree C per cell that's used in lead acid. We can vary that to accommodate nickel cadmium, of course, lithium and other types of battery chemistries. So that can be custom programmed. Okay, um, just a note here on uh, lithium because we wanted to talk a little bit about the differences between what we refer to as open loop and closed loop. Okay, so when we describe open loop, this would be charging a lithium battery as we normally charge batteries directly providing power to the terminals and our best sense of feedback from the battery on its state of charge is the battery voltage at the terminals itself okay when we discuss closed loop charging that typically refers to a communication link that is provided uh, through a variety of protocols between the battery and our charge controller and in those cases currents can be much higher Accuracy is much tighter and state of charge is communicated between the battery and the charge controller. Both are very viable options. And I have to say that in a lot of cases, you don't always need a closed loop solution. It's a nice, more sophisticated one, but open loop is perfectly accessible because there are a variety of ways to do it. You just have to take into account a few key settings. And I'll, I'll discuss those really quickly here. Um, Disabling temperature compensation and equalization, because those are typically not needed uh, for batteries other than lead acid. So with lithium, those can be disabled. Um, often the BMS is handling a lot of that balancing of the cells already, so it's a lot simpler to charge. Uh, the low temperature fullback typically needs to be enabled to ensure no cold temperature charging. Um, you need to make adjustments to the absorption and transition to float times, because they are generally a lot quicker with lithium. And then lastly, as I talked about before, LVD and HVD control is also important. You want to ensure that the controller is acting on battery disc, I'm sorry, load disconnect before the battery does. Remember that the battery has its own internal disconnect where it will protect itself at last resort, but you really don't want to see that happen too often because it can cause system problems. So it's a lot better to leave the battery active and alert and powered up and have the charge controller manage that as well. And you'll find all of this covered in the documentation with our energy storage partner program, uh, which I'll talk about um, where you can get access to all these very specific technical documents. Okay. Um, and, and as we had mentioned with the BMS, avoiding those internal disconnects is really uh, a key issue because uh, it's the only thing you have to watch out for that can be a bit of a gotcha that could disable a system. So. Um, and the last is when you do have the need for SOC measurement, um, there are ways that internal and external shunt communications can be enabled as well so that you can get an accurate reading for state of charge, either through a, uh, a system SOC type shunt meter or from the battery SOC itself. Okay, so I will pick up the pace here a little bit and just kind of go quickly through a, a bit of a quick tutorial on some of the ways you can access the information that we provide on the website. Okay, so first going to Morningstar's website, uh, you will see that under the Energy Storage Partner Program, under the Resources tab, that you'll see the list of the current brands of partners that we're working with. In this case, specifically Fortress Power has been highlighted and their documents are available right now on the website and you can complete this form to give us your interest and, and potential for follow-up support, as well as get direct access to the documents for download. And what these will do is provide you with uh, information on 
the MS View configuration files, which is a preset file that is already ready to go, verified between Morningstar and Fortress, and has all the pertinent settings that I just talked about already programmed into a configuration file. Okay, so you can grab that, download it in a zip file. Uh, I'm sure many of you have extracted zip files. We do bundle them all into one file and you can extract that. And what you'll do is then get a output folder that will give you all of the configuration files for many of Morningstar's products, okay? And the way you get to MS View is if you go under products and you go to about MS View, MS View is our sort of system utility for all of our controllers, and it allows data logging, display of current information, but most importantly, it gives you access to the programmability uh, that the Energy Storage Partner Program provides. Okay, so once in MS View, you load it on a Windows-based computer, you search for connected devices that can be connected via either USB or in some cases on a network with our ethernet connection. So here's an example of some TriStar PPTs that we are connecting to over Modbus IP. You connect to those products and once those are active, you load the TriStar MPPT setup wizard and that setup wizard will give you the ability to either read data from the controller or in some cases, write actual data back to the controller and program it in one fell swoop for um, uh, a compatible Fortress Power battery model. The TriStar and TriStar PW, uh, PWM and MPPT are the most likely products that you would use with Fortress's products because they are generally you know, 48 volts and on a, a much higher current level for residential applications. So when you read that file, you load it via your Windows Explorer, and then you'll see that all of these presets are loaded directly into uh, the TriStar. Um, of course, it's always useful to kind of review what exactly is being loaded, but again, these are pre-approved systems. Charging rates, charging stages, everything has been pre-calibrated, including the low temperature fullback, you know, the max and min temperatures at which the battery needs to have current reduced, and everything is preset. And then the last selection you make is to program the TriStar PPT. At that point, all the settings are placed and they will remain inside the controller for the life of its operation in flash memory. And uh, they will always be available for that controller, even if it's no longer connected to a data connection. Okay, so it's uh, something that a lot of our customers, especially in projects, will rapidly deploy many configured controllers for a specific battery application. Okay, so I'm nearing the end of the presentation. Just wanted to make mention of a few things that the choice of battery technology depends on several factors. You know, what is the expected lifespan? What are the maintenance requirements? Or, you know, in some cases, what maintenance would you like to avoid if it's a site that is difficult to reach or where maintenance is extremely costly? Uh, we've seen more than our share of helicopter rentals <laughs> for telecommunications applications that are extreme off-grid locations. Um, and then the last thing is your available space and budget. Uh, you know, So all these things need to be taken into account. And then whether lead acid or lithium is the best fit for you uh, can then be determined. And then most importantly, that the charge controller settings can be adjusted using Morningstar software available on our website, and those can be easily programmed either ahead of time or in the field. Okay. So that concludes the webinar, and what I would like to do is then um, bring back uh, Jing, and we also have uh, many of our other technical staff, including applications engineers available, and what we would like to do is now take some questions. Uh, that we, we covered a lot of bases here, and what we'd like to do is review some of the questions that we received uh, and discuss a few of those in the remaining time that we have. Okay, so one thing I would like to mention is I will try to pick a few key questions. We do want to keep the webinar to one hour total. However, if your question does not get addressed, what I would tell you is that we will be responding to them individually after the fact. So it will not get ignored. It will just be addressed individually via email probably in the following day or two after the webinar is completed. Okay, so, uh, you know, feel free to uh, submit any questions you have, and I will try to take a few here. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Jing, are you available again as well? Yeah. Okay, let me take a look. I'm going to expand my question list just one moment. 
Okay, so for the benefit of everyone, um, I will, there's a few that have been addressed already. Um, Jing, you have access to the question list as well, I believe, is that correct, along with uh, support yeah, from I Alex? Do. Okay, very yes, good. I do. So would you, uh, would you like to um, address, uh, there was a question regarding, um, let's see here. Would you, is, I guess if you can see the question list, would you like to take a few questions and you can go first and then I'll also search for a few questions as well to address from Morningstar's side? Yeah, sure, I can do that. Um, okay. But yeah, I do have, you know, of course now for a lot of clients who are based in the U.S. are very, you know, concerned about this tariff. Um, so far that information we have is that um, the, even though announced the 10% tariff, but there is no concrete plan how to plan it. And actually, we just had a conversation with a, a government entity. They don't even think it's going to happen. So at this point, we don't have much information. But if it's going to happen at Fortress Tower, we were trying to absorb um, you know, most of the costs and might be just you know slightly price increase. Again, you know, we're trying to make as uh, competitive as possible. Um, that's one question I know that is addressed here. Um, and I also got a question about a UN 9548 uh, test. Um, we are uh, we're looking to this test um, at this moment. Again, this is UN 9540 is um, a combination of the battery plus the inverter. And uh, so far, the UN 9548, so far I know, is more towards for New York City. Um, that's the standard they, um, New York Fire Department has come up with the uh, UL. Uh, we don't have it, uh, but it could be something we're looking to do in the future. Okay, um, good, thank you, Jing. And if you find any others you'd like, we can kind of alternate a little bit here. Um, sure. I will take a couple of questions that I'm seeing online right now. Um, one question was regarding something I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, there was a, a, a comment that I made that PWM is often more suitable than MPPT in high temperature scenarios. And it might be best to explain a little bit about this. Um, remember that in an MPPT system, the VMP of the module is being is often much higher than the battery. And a MPPT controller will actually convert that excess voltage into more current. It's a DC to DC buck converter. So higher voltages mean that more power can be extracted when that is available in the system. In colder temperatures, those voltages go generally even higher than their nameplate rating because as temperature goes down, voltage goes up. And you'll see that coefficient supplied on many data sheets for solar modules. So in those cases, an MPPT controller is able to harness that additional power in those cold temperatures, whereas a PWM controller does not have that DC to DC capability. Okay, so, and the other reason is that sometimes in our industrial applications, PWM may still be preferred because it is electrically a lot simpler in terms of design. There's no capacitors, there's no inductors. It is just a power MOSFET type of switching design. So in terms of simplicity, sometimes there's some, some preference for that. Okay, mm. um, let's see. Yeah. I want to um, answer a question about the temperature here. There's uh, several folks talk about, you know, the operating the batteries in the low temperature. Um, when you talk about, it, you can certainly charge the battery at a low temperature, even like below freezing, as long as the amperage be very, very small, it works. But again, uh, if you look at the LP chemistry, you know, on high temperature end, their capacity will be very consistent. And when its temperature start drop below, um, five degree, which is probably going to be like in you know, a 45 or 50 uh, Fahrenheit, the capacity will drop. So it will work. It just, you're going to, you know, basically going to hurt the lifespan and also the useful capacity. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, when I see it in some cold temperatures, Jing, what I kind of refer to it as just a bit of a jump start. It needs to get going. And then you'll find that <laughs> yeah. often, um, you know, once it self heats, either by supplying loads or accepting some charge current or both, they warm up yeah. internally and then it, it quickly gets up to normal operating level. So yeah, they are yeah. highly useful. And, and we've seen a lot of applications in non-climate controlled installations in off-grid mm -hmm. where um, you know they've been using lithium for even a couple of years now uh, and have not had adverse effects. But the nice thing is yeah, that they right. at least have that protection there so that they're not damaged. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just looking over the questions again. Um, 
One other question we had was, has there been um, applications where small wind turbines have been tested or only for solar panels? Um, with many of Morningstar's products, we can you know, provide compatibility for wind turbines. Most notably is the TriStar PWM controller. As I had mentioned, that was on the list of compatible ESP partner programming options, which means you can you know, make a lot of these changes to the TriStar PWM, and that product can be utilized in a system that is called a diversion system, which is a, a different type of charging technology, but it is compatible. So um, you generally would see much higher current ratings with some turbines if they are sizable, um, and lithium could be a really good fit for that as well. So yeah, we, we do not see that there would be any kind of restriction on using lithium with Morningstar controllers uh, in small wind systems. Right. All right, I'm just glancing over the questions. Um, anything else notable that you see, Jing? Yeah, I just have a agenda mask here about if, you know, there's some jurisdiction requires um, fire suppression for lithium ion batteries, if lithium iron phosphate is excluded. So we've been seeing, it really depends on the jurisdiction, how they interpret that. Um, we have clients that they just ask us as, as a manufacturer to give a, um, a, a statement and claim that our chemistry does not require ventilation, cooling, and then, you know, um, doesn't require, you know, a fire extinction. Uh, it, it works, but some jurisdictions very strict, they still, you know, require that. So uh, you have to verify that with your local um no, your local inspector. Okay. Um, I just want to comment on one question regarding um, BMS. It is actually a, a question that was already addressed here. I see in the in the form by um, Fortress Power, but I just wanted to comment on it as well. You know, when BMS data is available, there's a variety of protocols that are there, and I we have discussed this with Fortress. And one of the nice things with a lot of products that are uh, on the more advanced stage, such as the TriStar PPT, as well as our coming multi-wave and inverter charger, is that these products are future compatible and they're able to actually be adapted to use different protocols as well as communication standards. And when I say that, I mean the physical connection, whether it be Modbus over RS-45 or even a CAN bus interface. And anyone that's familiar with um, you know, these batteries, uh, lithium batteries typically will fall under can RS-45 or even IP-based control. So um, I think you'll expect to see probably a lot more closed loop uh, direct digital links between batteries and power electronics uh, in the near future. So, and I know Jing had mentioned that they are uh, looking into that and uh, Morningstar definitely is as well. So I definitely mm -hmm. tell you to stay tuned in that area. Yep. Okay. I think um, that is bringing us pretty close to the uh, completion for our presentation time. So what I uh, will do is uh, we will review these questions in detail and many times uh, giving um, you know some documents or very complete answers after the fact from the remaining questions. And um, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in the webinar today. Thank you, Jing, uh, as well for your partnership in presenting this to our joint customer base. and um, we will uh, keep you updated on future training events. And if you have uh, any other additional questions that we are available to be reached, of course, uh, directly at each of our respective companies. And um, we can continue to help you uh, anytime you need that. All right. Okay. Thanks Thank again, you, Brett. Jing. Thank you, everyone. Uh -huh. Yep. Thank you, everyone. And that concludes the webinar. All right. Have a great afternoon. Thanks. Bye.